uh, like I said, I would just like to welcome everyone to the uh, the third Lima Wear Lodge Research uh, virtual meeting. Uh, we started this like most others uh, at the start of the pandemic, and uh, it's turned into a tool that I think is something that we're more more than likely are going to use in the future, uh, not to replace the in-person uh, meeting in lodge, but as a tool to, to something that later on that we can use that in the downtime to have since we only meet four times a year. I think this is a, a way of getting together and spreading a Masonic light. And uh, to me, anytime we can get together and spread Masonic light uh, is a win. And I think that's, and these, all these ones that we've done and the ones that I participated in other areas, uh, has allowed me to see uh, other perspectives, other uh, information that I didn't know from across the world. And I think that's the one thing that I have to say that, you know, as much as what's happening is terrible, one of the things that we did get out of it is brothers who may have never met, talked, or even knew, uh, have a chance to come together and uh, talk Masonically. So uh, I'm pretty excited about that, uh, that uh, it's turned into this. Uh, uh, Worship Brother Brad, will you kind of, are you able to go over uh, a couple of some of the protocols for the evening? Yeah, give me just a second here. I'm gonna jump and put these out of order, so. Yeah, no worries. Um, so brothers, for tonight, if you've never attended one of our Zoom meetings, we kind of had just some general etiquette. I'm not going to go through these line by line, but some are more important than others. Um, and I apologize if I get distracted. I'm still letting brothers in or people in. Um, but everybody, as you enter and you come into the room, you are going to be muted. So don't um, don't be offended if, if you're, you stay muted. This is We're doing that for the purpose to hear Brother Jackson's presentation tonight. Uh, if you have a question, you can always put that in the chat or wait till the end of the presentation. We are going to have some good discussion tonight. Um, however, you are going to stay muted just for the purpose of the presentation. If possible, we would love to be able to see your face. Um, so if you have video, please turn that on unless you don't want us to see you. Um, obviously, be considerate of your surroundings and background, but if you have a video, we'd love to see your face. Uh, we ask that you limit distractions, be mindful of background noise, dogs, animals, family. Um, that can be distracting. Again, if you pop off of mute, I'm going to put you right up back on mute just for the purpose of the presentation. Uh, we ask that you practice grace. So this is technology and technology every single time tends to have an issue. Um, however, I'm getting pretty good at fixing it on the fly. So if something does happen, um, just bear with us and we'll get, get us back on track. Uh, afterwards, I'm going to send out a, a quick link to everybody just asking how you enjoy tonight as we are going to plan these again in the future um, and possibly ask for some suggestions and questions there. And then lastly, just everybody know the audience. So on tonight's call and presentation, this is open and untiled. So we do have Masons and non-Masons alike. Um, so the conversation when we get to that point, just know your audience with that. Uh, worshipful, that is what I have for you. And just a reminder, uh, after the, this is going to be recorded, uh, and it will be put on uh, our website, uh, WeamAwareLodgeResearch.com. So if you uh, miss part of it or you just want to re-watch uh, re it, you can have an opportunity to check that out. And I have to say, uh, our website uh, has grown by leaps and bounds, and it's very robust with Masonic education, book reviews, you name it. Uh, I highly recommend uh, going out there and checking it out uh, regardless uh, to get some Masonic education. So I'd like to remind you of that as well. Uh, the, we, we say that uh, we should not take any important undertaking without first seeking the aid of the deity. Brother Brad, would you like to leave us in prayer before we begin this? Yeah, brothers, if you take whatever um, you know place you will for your grace, if you join me, please. Uh, great, ar great architect of the universe, we thank you for allowing us to meet tonight in this form of fellowship and education. We ask that you watch over all those brothers who are not able to attend with us tonight. We thank you for Brother Thomas Jackson being here and healthy to present to us and provide us education and wisdom. We ask that you watch over all those men and women serving our country, both locally and abroad. 
and we thank you for all that you have given us and continue to give us continue to give us as we move forward through these lives. And all this we ask in your son's holy name. Amen. So would it be? All right. Uh, well, I'm going to get ready to introduce our our presenter for tonight. Our presenter for tonight is Right Worshipful Brother Thomas Jackson. Uh, right Worshipful Brother Jackson is the past Grand Secretary of the Grand Lodge of Pennsylvania and belongs to Covered Lodge 315 in Pennsylvania. He's one of the most traveled Masons in our fraternity. Uh, he has numerous international Grand Lodge honors and awards, not to mention memberships in symbolic lodges and appended bodies around the world. He also has written two books, Masonic Perspectives, Thoughts of a Grand Secretary, in North American Freemason, Idealism and Realism. Right Worship Brother Jackson is a very dedicated Mason and a brother who has championed the cause of bringing back craft masonry to its original design and purpose. And we are so uh, thankful and glad that he's able to join us tonight and uh, for tonight. And uh, Worship Brother Jackson, the floor is yours. Good evening, my brothers. It's a great privilege for me to be with you this evening. Uh, the paper that I am going to present tonight is one that was scheduled to be presented on July 6th uh, when Lexington Lodge and the Rubicon Society had the Zoom meeting scheduled, of which they conducted 13 of them. And I would like to say now that uh, I greatly appreciated the dedication of what I have found in Lexington, Kentucky. I guess all of Kentucky. Uh, I've been very much impressed with uh, with uh, John, uh, John Bissack and with the brothers that I had the opportunity to meet when I was in Kentucky. You you are doing something that that I doubt whether any other Grand Lodge in North America has been able to accomplish, uh, and I congratulate you on what you've done. Uh, my brothers. Uh, as I said, it's a great privilege to be back in Kentucky, even though I'm only here visually. Uh, it is my privilege to be able to be in your presence again. My brothers were facing trying times, creating an impact that we have never faced before. For every one of us, it is something that none of us has faced in our lives. However, to bring it into some type of perspective, statistics show that thus far, approximately three quarters of a million lives have been lost worldwide to COVID-19 during this pandemic. However, when the Spanish flu epidemic hit in 1918, over 50 million lost their lives. And that was a world with a much smaller population. I do not point this out to minimize our concerns, for it is a major catastrophe requiring a change in a way that we live. When it is over, there will be a considerable readjustment and rethinking. Hopefully it will contribute to a more constructive world society. It must have also required a change in life following the Spanish flu epidemic and remember that was also a time when the world was dealing with the ravages of World War I. It has, however, made more relevant the subject in which I will speak to you tonight, the topic of Freemasonry yesterday, today, and tomorrow. Utilizing a revised paper that I first presented to the Grand Lodge of Santa Catarina, Brazil, a couple of years ago, but still just as pertinent today. The grand officers there told me to speak for approximately one half hour. When I first began to think about this topic, I figured that with, even with all my deficiencies, I sh with that broad of a spectrum, I should have been able to speak for at least several weeks. <clears throat> Before going farther, let me point out that I speak for no Grand Lodge, nor any Masonic body. What I say is my opinion, 
that I have developed over 58 years as a Freemason. And having traveled over a great portion of the world for Freemason, observing its challenges and its leadership, and having presided over 18 Masonic bodies. That being my opinion does not mean that it is necessarily correct. It is your privilege to accept or reject whatever I say. All that I ask is you to think about what I said. I recall reading that a number of volumes that have been written on Freemasonry, numbers about 50,000, and that there are probably 10 more books being written on this subject in any given moment. <clears throat> this should cover all of our yesterdays. There are also hundreds of volumes written about the Freemasonry of today, and some being written about the projection of Freemasonry of tomorrow. Therefore, anything that I say would have to be a superficial rendering of what could be said. It is only common logic that when one examines Freemasonry, that he is dealing with far more yesterdays than today's, and perhaps even more for our perspective of our tomorrows. For that heritage to be a value to our future, we must deal with the issues of today. It matters not for how many centuries we may continue to survive into the future. The philosophy of Freemasonry can never outlive the needs of human existence. It is inconceivable that our philosophy would not always be applicable to the ongoing evolution of civil societies. Therefore, our actions today will have a significant impact on not only our future, but the future of world society as well. I have been extremely fortunate in being able to travel over much of the world, more than most individuals have by that privilege, and to observe Freemasonry of today all of which is a result of the evolution of the Freemasonry from yesterday. From those travels, I have made the observation that even though the structural premise of the craft is universal, the operating premise varies depending upon the environment in which it exists and the direction provided by the leadership. For us to fully appreciate the diversity of its influence, we must understand the variations of its operating premise. We must also understand the evolutionary changes that have play, taken place during most of its history. The Freemasonry of today is indeed different from the Freemasonry of yesterday, and yet the purpose for its existence has not changed. What does change, however, is the intent of the leadership to shape the Freemasonry into what they perceive it should be. The vision of the leadership determines the ongoing premise found in different areas of the world, subject to the sociological condition of the environment in which it exists. The environment we could not change, but it has been our leadership's response to the sociological condition that has created the greatest impact on on our present, as well as the potential for our future. It is not my intent today to speak on the subject of yesterday, in spite of the paper's title. <clears throat> there are far too many historians with a much greater knowledge and with a much greater capability to speak on our past than have I. I will speak principally on the Freemasonry of today and its potential for tomorrow. I am probably most well known in the Masonic world for speaking my mind on the condition of world Freemasonry of today and the need for the change in preparation for an influential Freemasonry of tomorrow. I will therefore speak principally on these two issues. However, I am also known for my support of maintaining the protocols upon which we were founded and thrived for 300 years. It is undeniable that today's Freemasonry in much of the world 
lacks the influence that it once had in shaping many civil societies. Part of that loss can be attributed to the change in society itself. As society evolves, it matures, and maturation generally reduces much of the need for our influence. Historically, Freemasonry seems to be at its best when its challenges are the greatest. However, much of the loss of influence must be attributed to the lack of vision of our leadership in recent years. One of our glaring weaknesses as leaders has been our inability to see the big picture of the craft. We spend far too much time on issues not within the framework of our purpose. We have lost sight of the great accomplishments for which Freemasonry has been known and concentrate our efforts on issues not paramount to our existence and of little consequence to society. I need not point out to you now, however, that what I say is not applicable. I'm sorry, I need to point out to you now, however, that what I say is not applicable to the Freemasonry all over the globe. Freemasonry in Latin America has, for example, been able to retain much of the structural premise upon which it was founded. And yet Latin American Freemasonry operates in, in an environment with much greater challenges than we know in the United States. Challenges by the dominant religious institution, challenges by a much higher poverty rate, challenges by a lower educational standard, along with restrictive governmental requirements, creates a less suitable environment in which the craft must work. Yet they have a more admirable style of Freemasonry intellectually and functionally than we have here in the United States. It is important that Masonic leadership understands what has caused operational challenges in other Grand Lodges and has negatively impacted Freemasonry to avoid the challenges in the future. My brothers, North American Freemasonry has lost 75% of its membership and much has been the result of the operational style driven by our leadership. <clears throat> the United States had at one time over 4 million members. Now we have approximately 1 million. Granted that there have been multiple causes for this decrease in numbers, but our obsession with large membership numbers has resulted in a decrease in the average quality of the member and has proven catastrophic to the craft. We failed to guard the West Gate. Freemasonry's future in Latin America looks much brighter than it does here in North America. This evaluation is not made as a condemnation of present day leadership in North America. We have simply become representative of what amounts to be an evolutionary process that changed North American Freemasonry from an elite, philosophical, learned, highly respected fraternity to a less than elite, almost ignored organization devoted to charitable objectives. My brother's Freemasonry is not a charity, and yet we have made it the core value of the craft in the United States. It is not the commitment to charity in itself that has caused the impact, however. It is the sacrifice of the principal purpose of Freemasonry in support of it. We have managed to excise from the craft those intellectual and philosophical standards that characterized it for most of its existence. I have not observed this in happening in most of the rest of the world. My brothers guard well that West Gate. Freemasonry was created by men with some of the greatest minds who ever lived. And there is probably no organization outside of organized religions that have crea has created a greater impact upon civilization than as Freemasonry. It also continued throughout its, hi <clears throat> its history to attract some of the greatest and best thinking members of society. It is important that we never forget that one of Freemasonry's greater, greatest properties 
has been its intent to take men from all social strata of society and seat them in a lodge room as equals. It was, however, those brothers with the greatest capability of thinking that carried Freemasonry to where it has been throughout its history. World Freemasonry today is in a greater state of instability than it has been probably for the largest part of its existence. There has been 31 new regular Grand Lodges consecrated since the turn of the century, and many have been struggling in environments with an inherent distrust of any organization as a result of decades of suppression or in environments where religious and government oppression dominates freedom of thought. Others are faced with having to deal with an ego-driven leadership, not only of bodies dependent to Freemasonry, but of Grand Lodges as well. Irregular forms of Freemasonry have become far more aggressive than we have encountered in the past. It is not only expanding into regions where Freemasonry is just being established, but also into areas where regular Freemasonry has existed for decades or even hundreds of years. <clears throat> In addition, various uh, irregular forms of Freemasonry are establishing relationships that did not exist in the past. This trend offers a definitive threat to regular Freemasonry and its potential for the future because they possess an opportunity to grow more rapidly since they are not hindered by some of the protocols of regular Freemasonry. Some, for example, uh, no longer require the belief in a supreme being or the volume of the sacred law upon the altar or the limitation of men only for membership or no discussion of politics and religion in the lodge room, etc. As a result, some for regular, irregular forms of Freemasonry take an active role in politics, creating animosities in some countries. And since the profane world does not distinguish <clears throat> between regular and irregular Freemasonry, we are all painted with the same broad brush. In addition, Freemasonry is being confronted by government requirements that did not exist in our recent past. Several years ago in Britain, they required all members of the government and constabulary to register as members of the craft. And just recently, the government of Italy has categorized Freemasonry as being a criminal organization in its ongoing investigation of the mafia and also requiring registration. <clears throat> we live in a country that other than the Morgan affair has never faced challenge in our existence. The regrettable result is that we have watched Freemasonry in the United States pass into a state of complacency that is now being replaced with apathy. Perhaps this COVID virus pandemic may create an opportunity for us to re-examine ourselves, the direction we are going, and what will be required to take us in a different pathway. It would also be prudent for leadership to become more familiar with what is happening in world Freemasonry and educate their membership regarding irregular forms of the craft. Regularity of Freemasonry is a structural base upon which we have erected our edifice to project a visible image to the world outside. Those Grand Lodges not operating within these parameters have, have <clears throat> either not adopted or have eliminated some of the basic landmarks upon which our craft is based. Some of these challenges to the stability of regular Freemasonry are a result of leadership either ignorant of or willing to violate operating protocols that has sustained Freemasonry throughout its existence. The result, regrettably, is a tendency toward fragmentation, an erosion of our unity, and a lessening of our influence in society. Another factor that we must deal with today that will definitely impact us into our future 
has been the development of modern technologies that have created a fertile pathway to be used by those who oppose Freemasonry and for whom stating the truth has never been a limiting factor in their use of it. The internet has become a valuable tool to spread the lies of the, to, or the ignorance of others to our brothers or to anyone else who reads it and lacks the knowledge to reject it. Of just as great a concern, however, is the misinformation that is placed on the web by well-meaning brothers who simply do not know. We should be appalled at some of the misinformation that can be found on the web placed there by our own members. With this modern technology, it is far more important today to set guidelines than it was in our past. Information that took days to be disseminated even a decade ago now takes seconds. We no longer have the luxury of time that we once had to decide if an issue will impact us. It will be, <clears throat> it will impact Freemasonry for many decades into the future. And we are, if, and if we are to have a future, we must extend our vision and prepare our leaders for that future. The way the leadership of today responds will determine the extent of our influence into that future. <clears throat> in some areas of the world today, Freemasonry is growing both in numbers and in influence in society. In other areas, Freemasonry is declining in both numbers and influence. And yet, all Freemasonry had the same origin. So its position in today's world was determined by the leadership's guidance and the environment in which it exists. There is no doubting that the Masonic leaders of yesterday served to create the Freemasonry that led into the Freemasonry of today. There can also be no denying that the leaders of Freemasonry today will serve to structure the Freemasonry of tomorrow. I have full confidence that Freemasonry will survive and function in the world, but where and how becomes the question. Over 30 years ago, I wrote a paper that I titled, What Are We Trying to Save? In that paper, I made the observation that Freemasonry is an ideal, that if we restructure it to save the name Freemasonry, and forget the ideal, it is no longer Freemasonry. The Freemasonry that we carry into the future must be structured on the ideal. The Freemasonry of yesterday may, with no reservation, lay claim to being a major contributing factor in the evolution of many civil societies. The Freemasonry of today has a clouded future in parts of the world brought on by the various causes, but remains shining brightly in much of the world. The Freemasonry of the future will be determined upon the vision of the leadership of today. What must be significant to us, however, in this unstable and unsettled world, is that Freemasonry continue to survive and indeed thrive with challenges far greater for 300 years. Our brothers survived the challenges of yesterday and we will survive the challenges of today. What we have today is a result of our brothers of yesterday. What will be tomorrow will be the result of us. My brothers, the Freemasonry of today, in my travels throughout the world, I continue to find that Freemasonry is at its greatest when its challenges are the greatest. Life may be a little more difficult for us today, but certainly no more difficult than our brothers faced in the past. And always remember, we would not know what good times are if we did not have bad times to compare them with. My brothers, Freemasonry is the oldest fraternal organization in the world. It remains the largest and most prestigious 
eternal organization that has ever existed. Its impact on the evolution of civil societies is unquestionable and unmatched. Its past is filled with heralded glory. It's present with couched anticipation. And with our commitment, its future will be secure. My brothers, I thank you for having me with you tonight. <clears throat> Worship brother uh, Jackson, that, that was outstanding, I, I, I have to say. Uh, I know in our conversations that we had prior to this meeting tonight, uh, we spoke a lot about what you talked about tonight. And for me as a, you know, having 10 years within masonry, uh, I've seen many of the challenges that you sp speak about and which you've, uh, you are warning us that we need to need to change. But I guess I'm gonna start to question you off and it's something that you said when we were on the phone, it kind of got me, got me thinking. And uh, you had said tonight that you were uh, in masonry for 58 years. And when we were talking uh, that you had for about 40 some years been talking about, we need to change. Was there a turning point that when you were as, as a craft mason that made you think we need to do better? We need to do more or something wrong. Was there a moment or a chain of moments? There was certainly a point. When I became a Freemason, it was a period in Masonic history uh, where all I saw was idealism. Uh, and I, very, I, I became greatly uh, devoted to the idealism of Freemasonry. It, 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 it was a, an, an, an entirely different uh, style of the craft at that time that we had in North America. Uh, and when I became uh, the Grand Secretary, uh, in, I assumed office in December 1979. And during the period of time that I spent as a Grand Secretary, beginning around 1980, I watched Freemasonry change through the uh, direction of the leadership that was provided. And I watched us become more devoted on increasing numbers of members and raising money to give away to charities than on the future of Freemasonry in its philosophical sense. I really experienced a dramatic change in the craft. Uh, and uh, I, I in, in one of the uh, papers that I wrote, I indicated that I was a consummate idealist. But over the years, and I became a pragmatist, and then I didn't know whether I was an idealistic pragmatist or a pragmatic idealist. Uh, but I became more realistic. Uh, and I, I gave a paper to the All-Canadian Conference a number of years ago that I titled, Is Charity the Core Value of Freemasonry? And in that paper, I emphasize that it is a core value of Freemasonry because Freemasonry historically, dating back to its origins, was charitable. But the charity at that time was directed to the members, their widows, families, orphans. We have made it in North America almost the core, well, the core value of Freemasonry. And much of our effort today is is to raise money to give away to public charities who will get the credit for spending the money. I think, I think in order for us to have any future to attempt to recover what we were and what we should be, we have to become more realistic and start to be more introspective and concentrate more of our effort in building our organization. And, uh, and not contribute our times and effort and our monies to public charities. There are hundreds and hundreds of public charities. There are very few philosophical fraternities. I don't know if that answered your question. 
I get off. You you answered it very well, and, and I I only bring that up is I, I know I had my turning point as well. Um, you know, coming into the Mason, going through the degrees, and mm -hmm. having that sense of awe, and then having my first business meeting, and everything I thought it would be uh, wasn't there, and it took uh, some time. Mm -hmm. I call it my dark years that uh, led me to uh, go into a conference in Lexington, uh, the Masonic Society. And it uh, challenged everything I ever thought I really knew. And it, it was my, my personal turning point. And from then on, I've continued to, uh, uh, to try to uh, better myself, learn more, educate myself more. And, uh, it's just, it was because of that turning point. So that's why I asked that. But as you see on the screen there, most of you should all see on the screen there, we put some, some questions up for discussion. And one of my questions actually kind of delves into uh, the third one there, what leadership should be concentrating on in North America. But I would like to add a little something to it. If the leadership comes from the craft, and there may be no real answer to this, but if our leadership comes from the craft and we haven't had, uh, and we haven't guarded the Westgate very well, and we don't know, and the people that we end up electing do not know the true aim and purpose of Freemasonry, how are we ever gonna turn it around? Is there is there something, is there is there a grassroots effort? It, what, is there a magic wand? Well, as, as you learned at the Masonic Society when I was there, I'm totally dedicated to the concept of traditional lodges. Uh, I, I was involved with the creation of that foundation, and I still serve on the board, uh, where to create a new style of Freemasonry, uh, where you put far more emphasis on the uh, educational aspect of the craft uh, where you concentrate more on uh, the philosophical uh, qualities of Freemasonry uh, where you uh, well very frankly uh, and, and let me digress here a minute one of the great problems that happened in North American Freemasonry was we made it uh, well, very frankly, made it so cheap that uh, we, we've lost the uh, financial value of the craft. It's it always amazed me, you find men lining up to join country clubs and spend thousands of dollars and complain about a $50 dues for a Masonic Lodge. This is a reason that the traditional lodges are going to higher initiation fees, higher dues, uh, required learning, required attendance, in, uh, let me give you an example. Down in uh, most of the Latin American countries, definitely in Brazil, first of all, when you petition a lodge, you are investigated for one year. If you are found worthy to join, to become a member, and you receive your first degree, then you are required to present over a period of a year five learned papers on Freemasonry. Then you stand an examination on the floor of the lodge, and uh, if you pass the examination, you're eligible to be crafted. When you get your second degree, then you are examined again in the floor of the lodge, but you will have presented five more learned papers, and then you can be raised to Master Mason. It takes a period of three years, to, or two years actually, uh, from three years from the time of petitioning till you become a member. They meet once a week, not once a month, and then attendance is required. In, uh, I reviewed the uh, Constitution when we were working in the Grand Lodge of Paraguay. It states right in the Constitution of the Grand Lodge of Paraguay, if you miss two consecutive meetings without a justifiable reason, you're subject to suspension. I've been in Grand Lodges where it takes six years to become a Freemason from the time you petition. And here we are in North America creating one-day classes. 
I look at one-day classes as the greatest abomination that Freemasonry has ever met. Uh, and, and they say they do one-day classes because men don't have time to spend one day for three months to receive their degrees. What value is that individual going to be to Freemasonry if he can't afford one day for three consecutive months? Uh, to, to really improve where we are, I think we have to change our style of Freemasonry. I think we have to seriously start looking and concentrate on our efforts on what is needed for the craft. And that's going to take a change in thinking of the leadership in North America because we've been uh, pretty much in the same style of Freemasonry all over North America for uh, decades now. Freemasonry started losing numbers in 1957. We peaked in 1957 and uh, began our decline in membership numbers. But we really began to plummet in numbers around 1980. And that's when we began to concentrate on numbers and lowering the quality of the members. Very few lodges, by the way, outside of North America have lodges with numbers over 50. Many of them much smaller. There you get to know each other. You truly are a brotherhood. We, our lodges have become so large. We had a lodge at one time uh, in Philadelphia that had 1,700 members. Uh, there can only be one master. There can only be two wardens. So what chance would anyone have of ever going through the chairs in a lodge at large? I, I'm going to ask you one more question, and i got a couple of brothers that uh, want to ask a couple of questions. So I'm going to get my one last in since I have the opportunity. Uh, where do you see the role of uh, research lodges such as ours? Where do, how do we fit into, into the scheme of things? I think research lodges are a vital component of Freemasonry. It's interesting, uh, Grand Lodge of Pennsylvania is the oldest Grand Lodge in North America, 1731. We never had a research lodge until 2000. When I retired as Grand Secretary in 2000, the Grand Master left me go ahead and start a research lodge. At the same time, I started the Academy of Masonic Knowledge, uh, both of which has been highly successful. It was amazing to me how many good thinking men we found in Pennsylvania that we didn't know we had through the research lodge. I think a research lodge can be a vital component to any Grand Lodge and certainly to Freemasonry because you not only find thinking men that you didn't know existed in your jurisdiction, but you also find men that develop an interest in Freemasonry by belonging to a research lodge. And I, I'm, I'm impressed with what you're doing there in Kentucky. Keep it up. Well, we, we very much, uh, thank you for that, that comment. And we are trying very hard in the state of Kentucky. Uh, and, and one of the men that uh, has been, I would say, leading the way uh, is Worshipful John Vizak. Uh, he said he'd like to ask you a question, so I'm going to turn it over to him. Brother John, are you on? Able to unmute yourself here? Thank you, Worshipful Brother. Tom's good to see and hear you tonight. Good to see you, John. You've answered uh, part of this question, but I'm going to go ahead and ask you anyway. You've noted in many of your papers and presentations that we've managed to excise from the craft those intellectual and philosophical standards that characterized it for most of its existence. So how would you see beyond leadership and environment as root causes why European masonry and masonry in other parts of the world have maintained their intellectual and philosophical standards? Well, they maintained them. They maintained them, John, because they wanted to maintain them. Uh, it's difficult in, to maintain intellectual and philosophical qualities when you don't find a great composition of that style, that type of individual in the craft in North America. Again, that goes back to our failure to guard the West Gate. 
and, and it's always difficult for me to answer questions that seems to be uh, speaking against the current membership of the craft. I don't mean to do that because again, as I emphasized in, and mentioned in this paper, we have to remember that one of the reasons Freemasonry succeeded was because it did take men from all strata of society, all classes, and put them in a lodge room and seek them there as equals. But realistically, you cannot take a, uh, the average individual and expect him to provide philosophical leadership within your organization. That is what we have lost in North American Freemasonry. We don't have those individuals to, to lead us any longer uh, on all levels. Uh, I, I would, I'm always impressed. Now, I mentioned that we had 30 new regular Grand Lodges consecrated in the world since the turn of the century. I've been highly impressed with the, with the men that I find in these lodges, the Grand Lodges, when I go to visit. Uh, I would say in one of the Eastern European Grand Lodges, probably 40% of the membership have doctorate degrees. Uh, now, that doesn't mean they're necessarily great men. Doesn't even mean that they're necessarily great thinkers. But it does mean they had the initiative to, to, to get the degree. Uh, but, uh, and, and let me point out that I grew up in a totally blue collar environment. Neither of my parents went past eighth grade. Uh, I, I, I did not have a, a great educational background. I got through high school, all I did was keep my grades up enough to play football in the fall and wrestle in the winter. And, and I managed to get through high school. I went to college and I finally discovered learning. Uh, so I don't mean in any way to speak against blue collar workers or farmers, trucks, I'm a farmer, uh, or truck drivers or anyone else. You're always going to find, and that's what impressed me to join Freemasonry was the caliber of the men that I saw that were in our community. Almost every professional man in the little town that I lived in was a member of Freemasonry. And that's what really attracted me. You're always going to find the farmer, the truck driver, the laborer, the, wanting to come in and sit with the doctor and the attorneys and the businessmen. The reverse doesn't become true. Uh, when I first became Grand Secretary and I go to the Grand Secretary's Conference, and Grand Masters Conference, we always met in Washington, D.C. You would have at any uh, one of those conferences, 20, 30 senators and House members sitting there. Today, there is never one. Uh, they don't want to rub shoulders with us anymore. Uh, so what we have to have, uh, uh, John, I think, is to re-inject into North American Freemasonry that same dedication to get thinking leadership back in. Uh, and, and the reason the European Grand Lodges didn't lose it is because they kept the same quality of the men in their lodges, in, the, in their Grand Lodges. I don't know if that answered either. It does, thank you, John. I apologize for my voice tonight. I, I'm generally known for having a big mouth, but it's not very big tonight. So we're, we're, we're brother, you, you're doing quite well. And uh, I'd like to hand it over to uh, Brother Brad Drew. I believe he has some uh, questions from the chat. You'd like to get out there, Brother Brad? Brother Brad, can you hear us? Oh, yeah, there you go. Let me unmute myself. Yeah, sorry. Um, so, <laughs> brothers, we have three questions in the chat, and brothers, I'll ask your question the best I can. And if you feel like the answer is sufficient, then great. If not, feel free to unmute yourself and, and ask any further. Um, so, Brother Jackson, the first question um, this brother's asking: Could you help? Could you explain possibly further or elaborate on why 
the influence in society is such an important matter with Freemasonry. His brother states, he understands the focus on the emotional, intellectual, and spiritual development of the fraternity, but doesn't understand the focus on the influence aspect of Freemasonry. You know, uh, it, in almost every country that I've been in, uh, the uh, sociology of the country, the environment in which it exists, pretty much drives the style of Freemasonry that will exist there. The only exception I found to that was in Russia. And in Russia, Freemasonry actually drove the society into a style of society, not the current society. I'm talking about the, uh, in, uh, the intellectual society of Russia. And that's the only country that I found that. I think it's vitally important because uh, uh, the presence of Freemasonry in almost every little country town in America, uh, there was a Blue Lodge. And the, and the Blue Lodges actually formed a, a foundation of, of prominent men who led then in the development of that society. Certainly the purpose of Freemasonry, and let me, I can't overemphasize that, this is the purpose of Freemasonry is to build the man, to take the good man and make him better. Our purpose as a craft is not to change society, not to build society. Our purpose as a craft is to build the individual man. It's then the responsibility of the individual man that will change society. My brothers, I would certainly think, and I wrote this in one of my papers, I think it would be more prudent for society to adopt the standards of Freemasonry than for Freemasonry to adopt the standards of society, and especially in today's society. Uh, I don't think you can avoid having Freemasonry's influence on society if we improve the men we bring in. And if we start with good men, uh, I don't think we could avoid our influence on society. Thank you for that, Brother Jackson. Um, our second question is, when do you suppose that we lost sight of Freemasonry being a system for self-improvement and became more of a social fraternity? Uh, this brother states that he believes 90% of Masons have no idea what the fraternity is actually about. I think around 1980, that's when I began to observe it happening. Uh, prior to that time, uh, everything I saw in the craft, and uh, maybe I was blind to the outside, but everything I saw in the craft was an idealistic, uh, and, and in my time as Grand Secretary, I watched Freemasonry and I watched uh, us change uh, from what we were. Uh, we became more permissive. The Grand Lodge began to adopt more of the work that subordinate lodges should be doing. Uh, we began to concentrate more on getting numbers into the craft. Uh, and, and here again, one of the causes for that was our failure in the past to uh, grow financially with the rate of society's growth in financially. We did not increase our dues. We did not increase our fees. We built all these giant structures. We needed the money then uh, to maintain our buildings. As a result, we were willing to uh, take any, uh, uh, lower our quality individuals we took in simply to get enough money to maintain our buildings. We have a building in Philadelphia, it's in my opinion, and I've seen most of it, but perhaps the greatest Masonic building in the world. But it takes a massive amount of money to maintain that building. About 15 years ago, we had the exterior cleaned. It cost us $9 million just to clean the exterior. That takes a lot of dues and a lot of fees. So uh, in order to get the dues and fees, Grand Lodges in North America have been willing to take, accept individuals that not that many years ago would never have been able to be a member of Freemasonry. And our rate of retention right now, I, I read just recently that when a man joins Freemasonry today, his average 
years of membership will be five years. Oh yeah, me, me myself here. Okay. Uh, so, ahead, sorry, ahead, sorry we, had, we have two more questions. Okay, <clears throat> uh, the next question, Brother Jackson asks, uh, have you personally, I would assume, have you been effective in leading your Grand Lodge and those brothers to more desirable positions? And if so, could you share any success stories or possibly best practices that are still uh, happening now in the Grand Lodge? Well, I, I certainly was involved in some of the decisions that were made in Grand Lodge. Uh, one thing you have to remember as a Grand Secretary, you don't take the credit. The Grand Master, whatever we accomplish, it goes to the Grand Master. It's not the purpose of the Grand Secretary. I learned a long time ago, many, many years ago, that if I made the same suggestion to men coming up the line often enough, when they got to be Grand Master, they would think it was their idea and it would fly. Uh, so I, I, I think I probably had some influence on, on the direction that, uh, that our Grand Lodge took on some of the programs. Uh, I certainly don't want to take any credit for any, from any Grand Master. Uh, and one thing I did do, when I would have young men come into my office, and uh, tell me they were interested in joining Freemasonry. And I'd look at their background if they were uh, good individuals, well educated individuals. I always recommended them to one lodge in Philadelphia. Now I think that's the best lodge in Pennsylvania. Uh, it's, it's certainly uh, composed of good thinking brothers, and they're very, very active. Uh, and I certainly in the effort that the Grand Master left me do to create the Research Lodge and create the, uh, the Academy of Masonic Knowledge, I think was a positive contribution to the Grand Lodge. Uh, I, uh, I think I may have had some influence. I, I, but I, one thing, one advantage I've always had in life is I never really wanted anything. Uh, I, I never sought to be Grand Secretary. I was astounded when they asked me if I would consider being Grand Secretary. I turned a considerable number of positions down uh, over the years. I probably turned more down than I had uh, have accepted. Uh, so uh, I, th I think I, I might have had some influence. I have more influence, frankly, in Grand Lodges around the world than I have in North America. I, because that's the reason I spend half the year in other Grand Lodges around the world. They're willing to listen to me more than, more than what I find in North America. And I'm not saying that critically, it's just a matter of fact. Brother Jackson, I received another uh, question here, and it kind of devotes its time to uh, regards to when you spoke about charity. It says, uh, you mentioned that you feel there is too great a focus on public charities within North American Freemasonry. With the intention of building a better man, it would seem that charity would be a critical component of that. Do you think that an increased focus on a more personal, individualized form of charity is, is needed? And what is your view of what that would look like? Well, the northern jurisdiction of the Scottish Rite and the uh, Grand Lodge of Pennsylvania, and I think the southern jurisdiction has developed almoners funds. And the purpose of the almoners funds is to take care of the brothers and their families and their widows who need help, which I'm highly supportive of this type of a, a charity. And uh, remember, I also qualified when I made that comment regarding uh, charities was that it was not the uh, dedication to public charities that hurt as much as much as the fact that we forgot our philosophical purpose in concentrating our efforts to raise money to public charities. What we were simply doing is trying to buy back the respect and admiration that we lost. Uh, and you can't buy admiration and respect. That is earned. That's the reason Freemasonry was so highly respected as an organization. 
Also, if you look back at the origins of Freemasonry, uh, it was a practice at that time of, uh, prior to the uh, development of speculative Freemasonry that there were funds set up to take care of the operative Freemasons and their families and injured brethren. And, and that evolved into the Freemasonry that we have today. It's interesting, there's a study that was done. I just read a paper recently. It was written by a man by the name of Kent Henderson in uh, Australia. Kent Henderson's one of the very prominent thinking Freemasons in Australia. And he wrote a, he, he's put in that paper the statistics of, of uh, the English speaking Freemasonry. I've been saying for years that the Grand Lodges that are failing the most rapidly are the English speaking Grand Lodges. And that includes the United States, Canada, Australia, England. Every one of those Grand Lodges are losing members more rapidly than any other Grand Lodges in the world. And they are losing, they all have the same style of Freemasonry with a great concentration on charitable giving. Uh, then he showed the Grand Lodges and many of the Grand Lodges in Western Europe, Eastern Europe, South America, outside of the English speaking, every one of them was, had increased over a 30 year span in the number of members that they had in their Grand Lodges. Some by 200%, the Grand Lodge of Turkey was 201% increase in their numbers of members gained over a 30 year span of time. And, uh, uh, I, and then what that did, the statistics that he provided was confirmed what I had been observing for decades. And, and not that, again, I want to emphasize, I'm not opposed to charities. I've been involved in public charities for years, and I'm not opposed to participation in public charities, but I'm opposed to it when it means we sacrifice our commitment to the principles of Freemasonry and the philosophical purpose of Freemasonry in support of public charities. If, if, if Freemasonry, for example, gives $100,000 to uh, uh, the Hart Fund, and the Hart Fund uses that $100,000, who do you think gets a credit for that $100,000? Now, I understand that charity, charitable giving should not be to have some type of recognition. But I look back when they were rebuilding the Statue of Liberty back in the 80s. Our Grand Lodge gave, I think it was 100,000 or a half a million dollars to that. You never saw the Grand Lodge of Pennsylvania mentioned anywhere. Uh, not that they should have, I guess, but you don't get any credit for it. So I'm not, uh, I'm not opposed to charitable organizations. As I said, I've, I've been involved with charitable organizations for years. But uh, if, if it means surrendering the qualities of Freemasonry to support them, then I can't support them. Worship Brother Tom Nischke, uh, we have a couple questions if I can ask those. So, uh, Brother Jackson, I'm going to ask you my, one of my own questions first, just because I am curious. Um, so. You spoke a little bit tonight about the membership boom and we focused on numbers and, and all of that. So my question to you is about the Grand Lodge of Pennsylvania. So Grand Lodge of Pennsylvania still to this date, I believe has the largest membership totals in the United States. Uh, and I think they and have for some time. Yeah, for some time, it's usually a competition between Ohio, Pennsylvania and Texas. Um, so I'm curious for Pennsylvania, what is happening in Pennsylvania that is successful? I mean, is are we just growing, is the is Grand Lodge of Pennsylvania just growing by numbers to grow or are there programs <clears throat> or practices that other Grand Lodges can learn from? Let me uh, tell you very simply to respond to your answer. When I became Grand Secretary in the end of 79, we had 239,000 members in Pennsylvania. Today we're on 100,000. So I don't spell that success. But very frankly, I would rather have 50,000 Masons than 100,000 members. Uh, Pennsylvania is not any more successful than any other Grand Lodge. 
Now, Ohio, the Grand Lodge of Ohio has taken in more one-day class members than any other Grand Lodge. Uh, they took in 7,000 in some in one year, in one-day class. At that time, Ohio went ahead of Pennsylvania uh, in numbers. But if you look at the MSA st uh, statistics that come out each year, the Grand Lodge of Ohio loses more members a year than any other Grand Lodge in North America. And now they're way under Pennsylvania in numbers, total numbers. But you've heard my opinion on one day classes. No, thank you. I, I live about 10 minutes from Cincinnati and brother Kimball here lives a rock's throw from Cincinnati. So I'm very familiar with the Grand Lodge of Ohio and their deputy grand master is a very close friend of mine. So I've shared that same with, that thought with him. Thank yeah, you. I have many friends in Ohio. I don't uh, <laughs> want to speak against them. I'm just pointing a statistical result of what took place. Uh, but I have many friends in, in, in fact, I helped raise, well, I helped raise uh, John Robinson in Ohio. And uh, another friend, I went to Ohio to confer his third. So, I'm not belittling Ohio. I'm just showing a statistical result of uh, numbers. Um, we, we have two more questions that I have, Brother Nitschke, and then we can do what we need to do. Um, the next question, Brother Jackson states, and, and I'm curious about this answer myself. So the brother states, with the generational change that's occurring and younger members not being as high, uh, and younger members in the sense of their age, not tenure, uh, not as high in Freemasonry as it has been in the past, how do we engage or what is your opinion or recommendation or suggestions for engaging younger members within the fraternity as well as being present within the community? Give them something to do. We take young men in and ignore them. Uh, get them involved. It's difficult, I understand it's more difficult because of the size of our lodges, but to bring young men in and get them involved right away in, in something is going to retain their interest. If they come into a meeting, sit there and listen to them, read the minutes, no educational programs, and they have nothing to do, there's no way you're going to hold them into your lodge. And by the way, that was emphasized by, in that paper, Kent Henderson also. One point that Ken Henderson made that I do disagree with, he minimized the need of learning the ritual. And by the way, I'd point out to you that most Grand Lodges of the world read the ritual. Uh, and I think that's, I, I totally oppose that. And the reason, one of the main reasons I oppose it is we state that our purpose as a fraternity is to take good men and make them better. I have never seen a man go through the chairs and learn the ritual that didn't come out a better man than he was when he went in. And when I took my degrees in Freemasonry, I was just so impressed with what those men were able to do. And I thought I could never do that. Well, Freemasonry told me I could and taught me that I could. So I, uh, uh, I think you have to get the young men involved. And you have to educate them. We sadly lack any educational programs in North American Freemasonry. Okay. Thank you. Um, the next question I'm going to have this brother ask himself, if you don't mind. Um, most worshipful brother Mati, will you unmute yourself and ask your question to brother Jackson, if you don't mind? Sure. Um, Most Worship, Brother, I want to ask um, for some conclusions after unsuccessful lessons, which you understand on the base of practice, because successful cases are um, known everywhere, but unsuccessful cases giving us much more information, what we will be, pre will be uh, preventing to do, to not follow wrong directions. And this could be, could be explained only by um, Masons uh, with a big history and experience like Brother Jackson. 
I'm not, I, I'm, I'm sorry, I, I didn't quite understand the question. You're... If we have unsuccessful cases, you learn much more uh, like, like results because you know what is prohibited to do. Because successful cases, it's okay, everybody understand them. But analysis of unsuccessful cases is much more, more better and knowledgeable for everybody to support them to do not choose wrong directions in the education and in development. Oh, you mean in uh, successful cases, you mean examples of what was done or what could be done? Exactly. Thank you very much, Brother Thomas. Well, I think uh, probably what we have to do is to look at Grand Lodges and Lodges that are successful Masonically and what they're doing. The Grand Lodge of California right now has very uh, uh, progressive and successful examples of Freemasonry and what they're doing. They've created, I forget how many new lodges just in the last couple of years, which is astounding. There's no other Grand Lodge in North America uh, creating grand, new lodges the way California is. I, I think that is an example that we should be looking at to see what they're doing. Uh, and, and, we, and, and one of the purposes of the Grand Masters Conference is to be able to meet with Grand Masters who uh, represent their Grand Lodges in North America and, and be able to discuss with them programs that they have that is meeting with success. Uh, I, I can't cite any specifically right now, but certainly what you're doing in Kentucky right now is examples of, uh, of what can be done to educate the membership. Uh, Brother Jackson, I believe, uh, and I don't want to jump in here, but I believe the, uh, he may have also been referring, most worshipful Brother Motif here, are there any any are there any unsuc unsuccessful cases or situations that have passed that we should learn from? So things that have not worked in the past that you've seen or been a part of or heard about that we can learn and grow from. <laughs> probably probably hundreds of them. I don't know them, uh, but there are certainly many examples. I've used the illustration a number of papers that I wrote that we keep doing the same beating the same dead horse i said it in my paper here tonight we keep doing the same thing over and over again and expect it to succeed and it never succeeds uh yes uh there were programs that we started uh, through the grand masters conference actually uh but all all the programs that i've seen recently in any grand lodge has been to increase numbers or raise money for charities uh one successful program was the uh uh the program for young people to help young people it was started by actually a grandmaster in pennsylvania and it was presented to grandmasters conference and it has continued up until the present time uh the foundation for i forget the title of it right now and it was a successful program uh, I'm trying to think. Uh, you know, I said there's probably hundreds of examples of programs that have failed, and I can't think of any to specifically. Uh, now, in my grand lodge, I saw a couple of programs that we started that simply did not succeed. Uh, and and we really started for the with the wrong foundation for them. Uh, boy, it's difficult for me to answer that and come out with specific examples. Yet they exist. They have to exist, or we wouldn't be in the shape we're in today. I can see them in some of the new grand lodges starting up. Uh, in, in basically, basically in Eastern Europe. And by the way, uh, if you read any of my writings, I've made a, 
comment on a number of my papers that the great future of Freemasonry in the world, in my opinion, lies in Eastern Europe and in Africa. And I've spent a great deal of time in Eastern Europe and in Africa. Uh, and, and they, the reason there is a great opportunity for success is they have great challenges. They're meeting with obstacles. Uh, they're the greatest problem in some of the Grand Lodges in these countries and in North America lies in the ego of the leadership. Uh, we have to we have to forget ourselves and begin to concentrate on Freemasonry. I've made the comment a number of times: Freemasonry is greater than all its component parts put together. And and individuals who are in Freemasonry to further themselves are in Freemasonry for the wrong reason. Uh, I, I, I probably did not answer your question, uh, but I know there are answers. Well, uh, that's why I'm asking. It's a difficult question. It's not a question for every, everyone. <laughs> <laughs> In fact, I would throw that out to anyone here tonight on whether <laughs> they have any examples. <laughs> yeah. uh, for as, far I as, as far as successful is, is concerned, I would say uh, uh, the creation of the uh, traditional observance style of Freemasonry has been one of the great successes. I've been on the board of the Masonic Relief Association for a number of years. Now it's gone out of existence. And I thought that was a vital component to Freemasonry in North America. Uh, the uh, Masonic Information Center no longer functions. And I was on the board on that. I thought it was uh, providing a, a vital component to Freemasonry. There are examples of programs that we started. They don't ex uh, exist now, but I thought really was a, valuable tool for our, our Grand Lodges. They don't exist anymore because we didn't have the interest to keep them going. First Brother Jackson, uh, I, I guess one of the things I was thinking of, and just briefly, was uh, when the age was taken from 21 in the state of Kentucky from 21 to 18, I'm not sure if that helped any. Uh, you know, it used to be 21, and then it uh, reverted down to 18. I don't know if that brought any extra. So I'm not sure on our own state if that was successful. I don't know how you guys did Is it still 21 in Pennsylvania, or is it 18? It's 18, and I oppose that. Uh, I, I gave this example when, we, when it was being discussed. I used to teach high school before I went into college teaching. And I had students sitting in my class that were 18 years old. And I made the comment then, I cannot imagine teaching a student in my class and then walking into a lodge at night and sitting in lodge with him as my equal because I didn't consider myself an equal to my student. Not that I was above him, but oh, I, good. I, when I was in high school, I admired my teachers. Uh, I, th I think I think a lot of goes to uh, looking at maturity, and I know there's different facets to it, but uh, you know, it, it, you know, age does give gain us some maturity. Uh, Brother Brad, did you have another question? I think you were trying to get it out there. Yeah, worst of all, it looks like we have two more questions. Um, so the first question came in to me. And this brother asks, um, Brother Jackson, do you believe that the primary purpose or goal of the original Masonic philosophy was one of personal self-improvement and that the most, the more visible signs of that self-improvement were increased expressions of friendship, morality, and brotherly love? No, I don't. I, I, I think uh, when Freemasonry first evolved from a uh, uh, operative fraternity or an operative organization into a fraternity, I think it pretty much was a uh, fellowship, uh, a, a, a group getting together to enjoy themselves socially 
And that's one of the reasons I still classify England or the British Isles as a social style of Freemasonry because they still retain that far more than we do. Uh, I think then from that, it evolved into what it became because of the quality of the men that it took in. When you consider that many of the men who belonged to early Freemasonry were also components and members of the Royal Society. The Royal Society is, was and is the greatest scientific organization existing. And these men who belonged to the Royal Society were vital parts of creating and structuring early Freemasonry. So no, I don't think we started out that way. And remember I said in the beginning of my paper, I don't always, I, I don't expect everyone to agree with me. You're well uh, uh, allowed to disagree with what I say. Uh we Jackson, I think we have uh, one more question. I think that's where we'll kind of end it here tonight with one more question. Uh, Wish my brother Brad, if you want to answer that last question there for the evening. Yeah, absolutely. So brother Jackson, the last question here um, states, it's very difficult to change the culture of a Grand Lodge or even a lodge. By finding like-minded Masons, such as those who have taken the time to participate in the various internet educational meetings and starting new lodges that hark back to the traditional tenets of Freemasonry, such as TO type lodges, would this not be a more successful endeavor for Freemasonry? Well, I absolutely think it would be. Uh, in fact, I look, at a, I look at the change of style of North American Freemasonry to adapt to a more traditional observant style of Freemasonry is our greatest hope for survival into the future. Uh, I, I, I think if we cannot change, we, we aren't looking at a very bright future. Uh, the estimate has been made uh, by more than one individual that we might have 20, 25 years left unless we can change. Uh, I think we will survive. I think we're going to become much smaller. I think we're going to become a different type of fraternity, in North, different type of fraternity for North America. I think we're going to have to change more to uh, a world style where you have small lodges, great fellowship, uh, intellectual uh, opportunities for the individuals. Uh, now, I think there is a future for North American Freemasonry. But it's gonna to have, to have to change, and I think to change into the, the, the traditional style that we're developing today in slowly is our best hope for a future. I don't look at it as a panacea, but I look at it as our greatest hope. Here's your brother, Jackson. Uh, I I can't thank you enough for this this evening. Uh, some frank, open discussion about Freemasonry uh, and its future and its and its our present time. Um, I'd like to just give you a floor for for a few. If you have any parting comments that you would like to make before we close this meeting, yeah, I uh, I would just like to emphasize to you that uh, what I say is not widely acceptable by much of the leadership in North America at times. When I first, and I've been speaking this way now for 40 years. When I first started to speak this way, no one wanted to listen to me. Now I have difficulty keeping up with requests for speaking. So I think there's individuals today, many more individuals today are starting to realize that what I have been saying and cautioning about for 40 years is, is becoming reality. Uh, and and, and I, never, I never ask everyone to agree with me. I used to be that way when I was teaching. When I went from, uh, and by the way, you made a comment here a little while ago about the age of 18, about a difference in the thinking. And that's one observation I did make when I left high school teaching and went into college teaching. There's a world of difference between an 18 year old 
and a 21-year-old. And maybe that's one of the reasons we're not retaining the 18-year-olds. Uh, but I hope I caused you at least to think. I don't care if you agree with me or disagree. I just hope that you think a little bit about what I said. Uh, and perhaps maybe I would, it'll be a contribution to uh, uh, causing you to adapt a little bit in your thinking. Thank you. I do appreciate very much this opportunity to be with you, though. It's been a privilege. Uh, it's been a privilege each time I came to Lexington. It's a privilege to be with you virtually tonight. Well, Worshipful Brother Jackson, it, it, the, the honor is ours. Uh, I can't thank you enough for tonight. And uh, I'd like to, yeah, you gave me a lot of food for thought. I have a lot of notes to, uh, uh, to go over. So I appreciate it, and that, that's and hopefully everyone else got something out of this. Uh, I, before I say some other thank yous, uh, just know that uh, you can check us out on weamaware.lodgeresearch.com. Uh, uh, you can also like us on Facebook. Uh, that way you can keep up uh, with our happenings, and we're going to have some more of these in the future. So uh, please stay tuned for those as we move through the year. I uh, also would like to... I thank Brother, uh, which was Brother John Bizak from Lexington Lodge Number One, uh, who assisted me in uh, getting this somewhat set up. So I want to make sure I, I say th uh, very much a thank you to you. Pleasure. And, uh, and to uh, my co-host, uh, Worshipful Bro uh, Brother Brad Drew, for assisting me in tonight. He's a more the technical guy, so uh, he kept us going on, on that end. So, brothers, I, I, I hope you found uh, more light and masonry tonight. And that's our goal, and it will always be our goal. And as you move forward, hopefully something tonight will make you expand your knowledge or your education, and uh, hopefully you'll make you a better man somewhere. So uh, for tonight, I thank you all, and you all have a, uh, a good evening. Thank you.